This 11th generation Honda Civic switches to eHEV full hybrid power in its mainstream form and adopts a lower key look. It's slightly larger than its direct family hatch rivals and delivers everything its brand knows about petrol electric technology, which turns out to be quite a lot. The Honda Civic, one of the global motor industry's most enduring model lines, has moved on. It's no longer built in Swindon, and mainstream versions of this 11th generation version no longer use a conventional engine, instead adopting a 2-litre eHEV full hybrid petrol power plant that's anything but conventional. Bringing new technology like this to compact, versatile family models of this kind was always a passion of company founder Soshiro Honda. Back in the 60s, when the best the motor industry could offer, a small family, was something like a lumbering Morris Oxford, it was he who pioneered the idea of a compact, fuel and space efficient family car with a high-tech, air-cooled, flat-four 1300cc engine. It was thinking that led to the launch of the original Civic in 1972, a model series that over the next half a century will go on to sell over 27.5 million cars across 170 countries around the world. With this 11th generation version, there's been a return to the more mature look of earlier generation Civic designs. Gone are the slashes and fake vents of the old Mark 10 model. Instead, this replacement liftback five-door hatch design Adopts a more conservative but still sophisticated look. This car completes the shift of Honda's entire model line to eHEV hybrid technology. Well, almost the entire model line. The company, thankfully, couldn't quite bring itself to abandon the Civic Type R hot hatch. So that continues with an evolved version of the previous model's 316 bhp 2-litre turbo powertrain. But the Civic eHEV is our focus here. So take a closer look before you sign up for the Toyota Corolla Hybrid it's directly aimed at, and for that, you'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the Car and Driving Road Test. It's a curious confection, this. An EV, but not an EV. Take a seat behind the wheel, and there's no key, just a power button to the right of the steering wheel. Press this, and the virtual dials on the instrument screen perform a few perambulations, and an EV symbol appears at the bottom of the right-hand gauge, slightly incongruously, because in most cases, the engine then cuts in fairly prominently. Exactly what do we really have here? The answer is a lot more of an EV than the engine note or the dashboard fuel gauge would lead you to believe. The full hybrid engine in question, a 2-litre, normally aspirated, 141 horsepower unit you can't plug in, and which is the only power plant now available in the mainstream lineup, isn't primarily there to propel the car. Instead, its main role is to generate energy for a little 1.05 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery that weighs just 36 kilograms and drives two electric motors. Only at steady high speeds does the petrol power plant clutch onto the wheels, that being the point at which the least fuel is used by direct combustion drive. Any engine works hardest moving its vehicle away from rest or at low speed, so if you can use electric motors to do that instead, it's obviously far more efficient. Hybrids have, of course, been working on this principle for over two decades now, but this one's different, primarily because unlike established petrol electric powertrains from Toyota or Hyundai, it has no gearbox between the powertrain and the wheels. Instead, the eHEV system itself shifts seamlessly between EV, hybrid and engine drive phases as you move along. EV drive propels you from start off and at low speeds, and hybrid drive cuts in when extra acceleration is called for. As mentioned earlier, only at steady high speeds does engine drive kick in, this being where the efficiency curves between electric and combustion power sources cross over. But that happens only briefly, because as you approach top speed and the required drive energy becomes higher again, the system switches back into the hybrid phase to re-unleash the full output of the electric motors. 
at the wheel, you won't notice any of these phases taking place unless you happen to have the center screen set to power flow, which gives you an energy monitor showing it. You can't manually activate any of the phases yourself, nor would you want to, because there's plenty else for you to control. There are various levels of brake regeneration accessed via these steering wheel paddles, the most powerful of which slows the car quite a lot. And three main driving modes, selectable via this rocker switch between the seats, eco, normal and sport. Plus there's an individual setting where you can tailor powertrain and steering response. The differences between these modes aren't huge and you'll probably ignore them most of the time. Honda promotes this as a driver's hybrid, which we thought was a bit of a stretch before we tried this car. We've already seen an earlier version of this 2.0-litre EHEV powertrain in Honda's CRV crossover, but here it benefits from the more recent technology the brand developed for the 1.5-litre version of that unit fitted to the Jazz and the HRV. All three of these EHEV models are about as suited to press on driving as your grandmother would be to a hot hatch. But it doesn't take very long to discover that things have improved a great deal in that regard here. Push on a bit and the throttle actually responds to your right foot instead of merely considering your request with infuriating slowness, as is the case with Honda's hybrid SUVs. This apparently is down to linear shift control, which better correlates engine sound to engine speed for more reassuring acceleration feel. And a winding road detection system, which on twistier routes ensures that the car is always in the most appropriate drive setting for throttle response. On top of that, a Rossier engine note arrives with sport mode. The power steering control algorithm has been retuned for greater feedback and cornering stability is aided by a 19% increase in body rigidity. A longer wheelbase, a wider rear track and grippier Michelin Pilot Sport 4 tyres. Plus, the hybrid system's central battery placement aids a low centre of gravity, so the car stays settled when you change directions quickly and there have been revisions to Honda's agile handling assist torque vectoring system for greater traction through the bends. All of this combines to make this car far more of an engaging driver's machine than its closest rival, Toyota's Corolla Hybrid, and far more engaging than most likely owners will ever need it to be. But Honda needed the basic platform and chassis engineering to be good to support the top Type R hot hatch variant of this Civic that for the time being it wants to keep on selling. That car, which isn't our focus here, is a very different proposition to this one. The latest FL5 Series Type R offering 315 horsepower, generated by an evolved version of the brand's conventional, unelectrified 2.0-litre petrol turbo engine mated to a six-speed manual gearbox, a setup largely carried forward from the previous FK8 generation Type R model. This hybrid Civic is of course a very different kettle of fish, but it's still decently rapid. The base elegance version making 62 miles an hour in 7.8 seconds, it's 8.1 in this top advanced variant, though top speed across the range is limited to 112 miles an hour. Of greater interest to this car's likely more mature clientele is the fact that ride quality from the passive dampers, though a touch on the firm side, is broadly excellent over all surfaces. Also important to note is that highway refinement is a vast improvement on any other Honda hybrid we've tried. It helps in that regard that the interior is well insulated and that the powertrain's been engineered so that the revs aren't constantly flying around all over the place. A more intuitive adaptive cruise control system is another thing that helps take the strain out of long highway trips and the car can also control itself at urban speeds too now that standard traffic jam assist technology has been built in. Predictably it's in town that this Civic feels most like a full electric car because in a lot of the ways that really matter that's what it is.
The boldness of Civic design seems to alternate with each generation. The Mark 8 model was avant-garde, the Mark 9 version conservative. This car's bespoiled Mark 10 predecessor was once again arresting to look at. But sure enough, with this 11th generation design, which only comes in this five-door liftback form, we're back to the kind of shape you'd pass on the street without a second glance. Honda, of course, doesn't see it like that, citing an exhilarating development ethos and claiming to have met consumer demand for emotional styling and dynamic feel. Perhaps exhilaration is defined differently in Japan. It does now have more of a mature look, though even that wasn't really what the designers were going for. The wheelbase stretched by 35 millimetres here in pursuit of a sporty coupe-like aesthetic. That's why overall height has been reduced with the tallest part of the swept-back roofline set further forward. Plus, the A-pillar has been moved back 50 millimetres, the rear overhang is 20 millimetres shorter and the wheels are relatively large at either 17 inches or, as in this case, 18 inches in size. Most of the more premium touches you probably wouldn't notice at a glance. The flush fitting door handles, the fact that the side mirrors are now attached directly to the front doors below the belt line rather than to the forward edge of the front door windows and new laser brazing for the roof, which allows the roof and side panels to be mounted close together. At the front, there's a sharper bumper design this time round, a mesh panel in this upper grille delivering what Honda hopes is a sportier look, whilst black garnish on both sides of the lower bumper around these little fog lights is supposed to give a more planted appearance. The headlamps smear back into the wings and each incorporate nine LEDs with pupil-like high beam positioning. There's also a bonnet line now 25 millimetres lower, with the bonnet itself now fashioned from lightweight aluminium. At the rear, the tailgate deck height has been positioned lower, as have the combination rear lamps. Their C-shaped graphic is as before, with the upper and lower part of each lamp illuminating to give a wide glow when the brakes are applied. These lights are connected by a central strip which emphasises the wider track, though the 1800mm body width is the same as before. The lighter rear hatch, as you can see, is very sharply raked and now features smaller hinges for a cleaner roof line. More significantly, Honda hasn't neglected to give it a rear wiper, a feature so often missing from liftback designs of this sort. Right, time to take a look inside. Now, the flush door handles we mentioned feature touch sensors, eliminating the need for a locking button. What's Honda added this time round to the cabin design? Let's find out. Once behind the wheel, it's quickly apparent that it's less about what's been added and more about what's been taken away. A huge reduction in button clutter means a return here to the simpler interface of the earliest Civics as part of what Honda calls a human-centred approach to interior design. There isn't the flair of, say, a Peugeot 308 or the minimalism of a Volkswagen Golf, and it doesn't immediately strike you as the cabin of the kind of premium brand model this car wants to be, but that's because it's trying to be different. And in some ways, different really is better here, as you'll discover after living with the exemplary dashboard, wheel and seat ergonomics for a few days. Honda's always been really good at that sort of thing. It still is. What, to date, the brand hasn't been good at is infotainment and media connectivity. So it's just as well. That's taken a big step forward here. Honda wants to highlight that, which is why the freestanding 9-inch Honda Connect centre screen, now provided, has been lifted further up the dash than is the case with some of the brand's other recent designs. Its graphics still look a bit outdated and it's very slightly angled away from the driver, something Honda hasn't bothered to change from left-hand drive markets. But in every other way, this enhanced monitor is a big step forward, now featuring cutting-edge stuff like over-the-air updates and 3D urban modelling as part of its built-in navigation system. As you'd expect, there's Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, though unfortunately it's not of the wireless kind, 
And there's a decent quality eight speaker audio system that on this top model is upgraded to a 12 speaker Bose Centerpoint setup, which claims to offer concert hall quality of sound. All versions of this display get a much improved voice command system, the Honda Personal Assistant, which can respond to multiple commands. For instance, OK Honda, find me an Indian restaurant with Wi-Fi and free parking. The extent of further screen tech depends on how much you've spent. Lower and mid-range models get an instrument binnacle with rather basic 7-inch multi-info meter display dials. Only this top advanced version features the full-width instrument display. You might expect all versions of such a cutting-edge hybrid model to have. Honda calls this 10.2-inch screen configurable, but there's no selection of display formats, nor can you have full-width GPS mapping. Instead, flanked by a battery charge readout on the left and a fuel readout on the right. This display offers a left-hand power meter and a right-hand speedometer. These two main virtual dials separated by a drive assist display with a digital speedo above. Along the base of the screen there are temperature, gear selection, drive mode and odometer readouts. And the centre of the two dials can feature further info for audio on the left and trip computer data on the right. Aside from screens, there are two other things you'll quickly notice here. The first is this honeycomb mesh trimmed vent strip, which stretches away across to the passenger side and via these three silver toggle switches can diffuse the air being emitted, avoiding the usual wind in your face sensation. The other pleasant surprise might be the seats, which are a lot more comfortable than those of the previous generation model, thanks to so-called body stabilizing design. This sees both front chairs incorporate a planar resin mat structure, which better supports the occupant's entire lower body, from the pelvis through to the lumbar areas and the spine, for greater stabilisation and cornering support. It's great for longer journeys and one of the things that might really sell you this car. Powered lumbar support is standard across the range and, depending on spec, upholstery is either fabric, fabric and faux leather, or, as in this case, a mixture of leather and synthetic leather. This being another car with a shift by wire, also gearbox operated by buttons rather than a lever, this is also another car with a high set lower centre console that doesn't quite connect with the dash, which looks a bit odd. Still, just above it, you'll probably be pleased to find that proper physical dials for the climate system have been retained. That centre screen we just mentioned has a proper volume button too. Not everything's great, of course. The dash decluttering program hasn't stretched to the steering wheel, which remains overbuttoned. The pedals are offset from the line of seat and steering, which might lead to a few aches after a few hours at the wheel. And Honda seems to have missed a few of the established marks of premiumness. Things like covers for the cup holders and the connectivity ports. But the ergonomic rightness we mentioned earlier makes up for a lot. Take the wider than normal degree of adjustment for both steering wheel and seat, which should allow almost any height or weight of occupant to get really comfortable. We like the little touches too, like the mechanism on this large capacity central storage box, for instance, which pops the top automatically to 60 degrees, so you don't have to twist your body to lift the lid. What else? Well, there are no awkward haptic switches or silly slider bars, and build quality is far better than in, say, a Volkswagen Golf or any other mainstream brand model in this segment, come to that. That's immediately obvious from the way the door thunks shut, and the interior is really nicely trimmed as well. All of the touch points feature surfacing in either aluminium or a soft touch finish, and the door pulls are wrapped in padded faux leather. The cabin feels more spacious than most rivals as well, particularly in terms of head and shoulder room. And Honda's thought about usability as well, so the herringbone black areas of the centre console, and in this case the door cards, are coated in a scratch and fingerprint resistant finish. And the wireless phone charger you get on most models here in this centre bin is larger than is usual, so it can take the latest and largest smartphones. Talking of bins, interior storage space isn't anything to write home about. The door pockets and the glove box are both on the small side. And the bin we just mentioned at the base of the centre stack, which has twin USBs and a 12 volt just above, is rather shallow. 
Still, the box between the seats we referenced earlier is deep and has a lift-out tray. There are ticket clips on the front face of each sun visor. And unlike most of its rivals, Honda hasn't forgotten an overhead sunglasses compartment. All-round visibility isn't perfect over your shoulder, but there are parking sensors and a standard rear-view camera to help with that. Forward vision's much improved thanks to the way the A-pillars have been pulled back. Right, let's take a look in the back. We didn't know quite what to expect here because, though at 4.55 metres, this car is the longest model in its class. Its 1.41 metre roof height is also the lowest. That roof height issue is something you'll notice when leaning across to strap down child seats and when getting in. Honda claims that despite the lower roofline, actual interior ceiling height is the same as it was in the previous generation model, thanks to the way that the tailgate support hinges have been moved outwards. That may be, but taller folk might still want more headspace back here, particularly on models fitted with this big panoramic glass roof. We've got no complaints about leg space, though, which is up by 35 millimetres and is better than you get from most class rivals. It's an airy space, too, even without this panoramic roof, thanks to the inclusion of these tiny rear quarter light windows and the way the top of each inner door card has been shaped to actively pick up outside light. The EV-style drivetrain's IPU, or Intelligent Power Unit, sits beneath this bench, which makes it impossible for Honda to offer the clever magic seat system you get on their comparably priced HRV crossover. With that, the base of the rear bench can lift up cinema seat style for the carriage of taller items. Prior to 2017, Civic models got that magic seat set up too. In compensation, Honda says that it's reduced the size of the IPU so that a thicker seat base can be fitted. Fitting three folk across the back might be a little awkward thanks to the height of this centre transmission tunnel. When there are only two of you, you'll be able to use this centre armrest with its incorporated twin cup holders. Avoid base trim and you get rear vent air conditioning, though there are no controls for it. Honda doesn't give rear seat folk individual reading lights either, but you do get twin USB ports, overhead coat hooks, seat back pockets and bottle holders in the doors. Let's finish with a look at the boot. Now, even on this top spec model, there's no power assistance for the tailgate, nor is it an option, which isn't ideal because it's pretty heavy, even though Honda's reduced its weight by 20% by fashioning it from resin. And once the hatch rises, you're offered a cargo area that's 410 litres in size. That falls to 404 litres in this top advanced model because of the Bose audio system. Either way, that's pretty generous by family hatch standards. A comparable Toyota Corolla 2-litre hybrid offers just 313 litres. But it will, of course, feel a little small if you're coming from an SUV. Still, this load area is deep and will take up to six carry-on suitcases. It also has a wide opening aperture to compensate for the rather high loading lip. And there are a few extra shallow compartments below the non-adjustable boot floor, though no spare wheel resides beneath. You'll either love or hate this load bay cover. Instead of the usual five foot long fixed parcel shelf, there's a flimsy panel attached to the tailgate glass, which combines when the tailgate's shut with this retractable cover, a fabric strip you pull from left to right out of a little detachable cassette. It's certainly simpler to stow when you don't need it, but it creases easily when retracting back and when it's in place, there are no cargo area bag hooks to use. Honda does provide the usual four floor tie downs and there's a 12 volt socket on the right. If you need to transport longer items, you'll be disappointed that this Civic provides neither a ski hatch or a 40-20-40 split rear seat back. So long items like skis must go on the roof, which can take up to 65 kilos of weight. With the rear bench flattened, an uneven load area of 1,220 litres in size is revealed. It's 1,187 litres in this advanced model. 
That's if you load up to the roof. It's 820 litres or 814 litres on the advance if you load up to window level. For car makers these days, a family hatchback isn't the profitable thing it once was. Not so long ago, C-segment models like this used to account for a fifth of all European car sales. Now that number's down to around 16% and still falling as the appeal continues to grow of SUVs and crossovers. Honda's been more affected than most by this trend, which partly explains why, from a point at the turn of the century, where it regularly recorded over 100,000 annual UK sales, it's now targeting no more than 30,000 today. That would still be 37% of Honda's total European output, though, with a big proportion made up of Civics. So it's important for this car to be priced and specced just right. Is it? Let's see. As you'll know if you viewed other sections of this film, this mainstream model comes only with one body style. This five-door hatch and one engine option, a full hybrid setup, which means that auto transmission is mandatory. At the time of this test in autumn 2022, Honda was asking from just under £30,000 for this Civic EHEV in its base elegance form, with £1,000 more required for mid-range sport trim. From launch, the brand was asking around 33000 for this top advance model. The only other Civic model available is the fiery Type R hot hatch, which was just about to be launched at the time of making this film and isn't our focus here. For reference, this uses a far more conventional drivetrain, a two-litre turbo petrol engine mated to manual transmission, but has the same five-door body shape. So, what about the value proposition of this EHEV hybrid model? If you haven't kept up with the increases in family hatchback pricing recently, you might think that £30,000 is rather a lot of money to spend on a family hatch. If you're up to date with the way that prices have spiralled since Covid, you'll be less surprised. We're not going to make comparisons with every Focus or Astra-sized family hatchback in the segment because this Honda is aimed at a slightly different crowd who appreciate the difference that the proper full hybrid technology fitted here can make. If you do want a takeaway value perspective, then we'd counsel you at the outset not to be confused by the many models in this class that claim to be hybrids but actually use much less effective mild hybrid technology, which makes very little difference to running costs at all. Cars like Ford's Focus, the Mazda 3, Skoda's Octavia and Seat's Leon all attempt to hoodwink you in that way, as does the Volkswagen Golf, which in E-TSI mild hybrid form with a decent standard of trim could easily cost you Civic E HEV money. The rival Honda's really aiming at here, though, is the segment-defining full hybrid model in this class, Toyota's Corolla. At first glance, the latest improved version of that car seems identically priced to a Civic E HEV, but when you take a closer look, you'll see that the Corolla's entry price applies to the base 1.8-litre, 140-horsepower model. For a fair comparison against this 181-horsepower Civic, you'd need the 2-litre hybrid Corolla variant, which also puts out 184 HP, but will require nearly £2,000 more from you. In the absence of Toyota's Prius and Hyundai's Ioniq from the full hybrid family hatch C segment of the market, both are no longer made, the other car you might conceivably have on your radar is the Kia Nero Hybrid, which is a fraction cheaper than this Honda, but is a fraction smaller and much less powerful too. It also claims to be a crossover, which is something most Civic E HEV customers won't want. If they did, they'd have been directed to Honda's HRV or CRV SUV models instead. There are plenty of SUV full hybrids of similar size, Toyota's Corolla Cross and RAV4 models. The Subaru Forester e-Boxer, the Kia Sportage and the Hyundai Tucson can all be had with a non-plug-in full hybrid engine. But they'll all cost you more than this Honda, in some cases substantially more. 
A hybrid Lexus ES Saloon is much closer to the kind of car this Honda is, but one of those will cost you from around £40,000. If having considered all of this, you conclude that it is a Civic E HEV that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous Honda has been with standard specifications. So let's take a look at that now. Even entry-level elegance trim gives you quite a lot. You get 17-inch, two-tone black and diamond-cut alloy wheels, LED headlights with a high-beam support system, auto headlamps and wipers, rear privacy glass, all-round parking sensors, adaptive cruise control, a security alarm system, and smart entry and start keyless entry. There's also a really high standard of Honda sensing camera safety kit which is fitted right across the range and we'll brief you on that in a few minutes. Inside with elegance trim you get dual auto air conditioning, a reversing camera, heated front seats with electric lumbar support for the driver and a seven inch multi-info instrument display screen. Plus there are paddles for control of regenerative braking and deceleration. Infotainment connectivity is taken care of by a Honda Connect 9-inch touchscreen, which incorporates navigation, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, live traffic information and an 8-speaker DAB audio system with front tweeters. Plus, you get over-the-air updates and a much-improved voice command system. With this car, Honda is also offering the latest version of its Honda Plus smartphone app, which includes remote vehicle locking and unlocking, plus intelligent geofencing, which alerts an owner if the vehicle breaches a preset geofence zone. Plus, there's the ability to send journey information from the app to the car's navigation system. So, that's covered what you get with base elegance spec. Most Civic customers, though, progress further up the lineup, at least as far as mid range sport trim, identifiable by larger 18 inch gloss black alloy wheels, gloss black mirror caps, low gloss black window surrounds, and LED front fog lamps. Inside, the sport model is set apart from the base version by red meter illumination and upholstery that's a combination of synthetic leather and fabric. At this level in the range, you also get rear vent air conditioning, an auto dimming rear view mirror and a wireless charging mat. Here we've got the top advanced model set apart by a two tone black and diamond cut finish for its 18 inch alloy wheels, aluminium trimming around the headlights and a glass panoramic roof. Inside, advanced trim gets you a larger 10.2 inch multi info instrument display screen a premium Bose 12-speaker audio system, power adjustment for the front seats with eight-way adjustment for the driver, a heated steering wheel and upholstery in full leather, though to suit the car's eco remit, it's of the synthetic kind. At this level in the range, the LED headlights feature adaptive driving beams. These use the car's onboard camera to detect vehicles in front, automatically switching multiple LEDs on and off individually to provide clear visibility without blinding others. The system can also switch to high beam itself, making it easier for the driver to concentrate on the road. So that's covered off the three trim levels, but what about extra cost options? Well, before you start with these, bear in mind you are almost certainly going to be paying your Honda dealer more for your choice of paint colour. The only standard shade is a rather dour sonic grey pearl finish. The other four colours cost £625 extra, and they're crystal black pearl, premium crystal red, metallic, premium crystal blue, metallic, and, as in this case, platinum white pearl. And beyond that, well, we'll start with aesthetic extras. There's a sports pack of Berliner black painted parts, including a ducktail spoiler, side lower decorations, door mirror covers and dark chrome emblems. All features also available separately. If you don't like Berliner black, similar styling packs in Ilmenite titanium, carbon and Nordic silver are also available. Additionally, you can add side body trims, fog light decorations, rear lower decorations, boot sill decorations and elegance floor mats. 
Door sill garnishes are available, or you can have door sill trims illuminated in red or white. Interior illumination can be specified in red or white too. As for practical touches, well, you can add front and rear mud flaps, and there's a dog walkers pack, which gives you a dog guard, front and rear rubber mats, and a foldable boot mat. All items are also available separately. For the boot, you can add a hammock style cargo area net, plus of course, there are the usual roof crossbars and carriers for skis, snowboards, a roof box or bicycles. If you've specified the detachable tow bar with its 13 pin trailer harness, you can also add a bicycle carrier which takes up to two cycles. On to safety. Now, it's worth pointing out at the outset that structurally, this 11th generation Civic is a much safer piece of design. It incorporates revised structural components for improved front, rear and side collision protection. And these include additional front door stiffeners and rear wheel arch frames that improve side impact performance as well as front bumper beam safety plates that absorb impact energy to reduce the risk of leg fractures and knee ligament damage for pedestrians in the event of a collision. But the headlines with this car inevitably centre on camera safety provision, based around what the brand calls its Honda Sensing System, with every feature available fitted to every trim level. The first thing to say here is that not all camera safety systems are the same. Quite a few cars in this class still use the kind of millimetre wave radar setup that featured on the old 10th generation Civic. This Mark 11 design replaces that with sonar sensors, four at the front and four at the rear, which use the reflection of sound waves to detect non-metallic objects such as glass and walls far more reliably and with far greater accuracy. The Civic eHEV also benefits from the addition of a front wide view camera, which provides a wider 100 degree view and enables enhanced recognition technology to improve the car's capability to identify road lines, verges, motorcycles and cyclists. A new high speed processing chip has been used to improve the detection, performance and control of the system meaning the Honda sensing system can detect objects earlier and more accurately than conventional millimetre radar systems, including pedestrians in light and dark environments. As you'd expect, the sensing package includes autonomous braking, which is made up of two parts. The forward collision warning system is designed to detect the presence of vehicles in front of this one and issues audible, visual and tactile alerts to the driver if they are approaching with too much speed. If the driver fails to respond, the collision mitigation braking system is triggered, which automatically applies light brake pressure to help reduce the likelihood or severity of a frontal impact. If the updated system senses imminent collision, it will break forcefully. There's also a cross traffic monitor, which also benefits from the improved sonar sensors, enabling the Civic to warn the driver sooner about cars approaching from either direction when reversing from a parking space or driveway. On the move, radar tech allows the Civic to scan each side of the vehicle from the front doors backward, helping to increase the range of the blind spot detection from three metres, as previously, to now as much as 25 metres. When recognising a vehicle occupying the adjacent lane or approaching diagonally from behind at a significant speed, the system will display a visual warning on the side mirrors when it comes into a range of approximately 25 metres or less, improving safety for drivers looking to switch lanes at high speeds. You'd expect to find a lane keeping assist system on a car of this price these days too. This one also recognises the curvature of corners to optimise the timing of turn-in and turn-out assistance and appropriately reduce the driver's workload through each turn. Assist correction is also featured, which significantly improves centre traceability in case of cantered roads, crosswinds or pressure drop next to a truck. When the lane keeping assist system is disabled, road departure mitigation monitors vehicle lane position and issues visual and tactile alerts if the vehicle drifts into another detected lane without signalling. You can tell from all this kind of technology that the delineation lines between safety camera technology and autonomous driving tech are getting ever more blurred. 
You wouldn't expect too much of the latter from a car at this price point, but Honda has added traffic jam assist. This reduces the driver's workload in low-speed congested traffic by helping to keep the vehicle in its lane, starting from rest upwards. When traffic congestion clears from around 37 miles an hour, this setup seamlessly switches to the lane keeping assist system. A perhaps more familiar piece of drive assist tech is found with the adaptive cruise control system that, as we mentioned previously, all Civics now have. Honda's improved this setup so that it can detect vehicles much earlier and more accurately than before enabling progressive acceleration and braking for a gradual and more human reaction. When overtaking a car, the system works in conjunction with the indicator and steering operation to provide strong acceleration depending on the specific driving situation. When a slower vehicle leaves the lane ahead, the system gently accelerates back up to the speed the adaptive cruise control has been set at. It also responds more quickly when changing into an open lane from behind a slower car and when a slower car moves out of the lane ahead. We should also tell you that all Civics include traffic sign recognition with or without an overspeed warning feature, which if set will alert you if you go over posted speed limits. There's also a driver attention monitor which detects driver drowsiness and will alert you to stop for a restorative coffee. Preceding vehicle proximity warning detection will stop you getting too close to the vehicle in front and there's a deflation warning system for tyre pressure loss. Passive safety stuffs well covered off too. A total of 11 airbags come as standard, including knee airbags for both of the front seats to reduce occupant injury during front impacts. Plus, there are side airbags for the rear seats. Also new is a front centre airbag to prevent a collision between the driver and front passenger during a side impact. It's all very reassuring. This Japanese brand's bold ambition is to bring traffic collision fatalities involving Honda automobiles and motorcycles to zero by 2050. And you'd have to say, looking at what's provided here, that they're going about it the right way. It's easy to forget that Honda was a hybrid pioneer with its first hybridized model, the daring Mark I Insight, appearing very shortly after Toyota's original Prius at the end of the 90s. The brand followed this up with a more conventional Insight hybrid model and a hybrid Civic saloon, but was then slow to build on that momentum. It's done so now though, and by the time of this test in autumn 2022, all mainstream Honda models featured full electrification. The last of these to arrive before this Civic, the HRV crossover, disappointed us a bit with its efficiency showing. That 1.5 litre, 129 horsepower model managing 52.3 mpg on the combined cycle and 122 grams per kilometre of CO2, about the same as much less sophisticated mild hybrid models in its segment. But Honda's eHEV technology has clearly progressed a lot in the short time since the HRV was launched as you can see from the fact that this faster, larger capacity 2 litre, 181 horsepower Civic eHEV easily betters its smaller sibling showing in base elegance form recording a combined cycle figure of 60.1 mpg and 108 grams per kilometre of CO2. It's 56.5 mpg for the Sport and advanced versions with their larger 18 inch wheels Variants which record 113 and 114 grams per kilometer of CO2 respectively. Either way, that's in the same ballpark as this model's closest rival, the two liter hybrid version of the Toyota Corolla, which manages bests of 57.6 mpg and 111 grams per kilometer of CO2. Did Honda really need to go to all this trouble to create this car's complicated eHEV drivetrain? Well, initially you might wonder. Family hatchback models with far simpler mild hybrid engines deliver efficiency figures which at first glance aren't massively different. A 148 horsepower Volkswagen Golf E TSI DSG Auto manages 51.4 mpg and 126 grams per kilometre. 
and a 153 horsepower Ford Focus 1 litre EcoBoost MHEV also manages 53.3 mpg and 119 grams per kilometer. But Honda contends that real-world driving returns are very different from official WLTP figures like these, and we have to say we agree. In driving this Civic, we found ourselves able to get around 60 mpg around town and close to 50 mpg the rest of the time. In testing the mild hybrid models just mentioned, we've managed nowhere close to that. And the last 2-litre full hybrid Toyota Corolla we tested was way off this kind of showing too. You might wonder how close this Honda's efficiency figures are to a diesel-powered rival. The answer is pretty much on a par for economy, but much better for emissions. A comparable 148 horsepower Volkswagen Golf, 2-litre TDI DSG manages 62.8 mpg and 119 grams per kilometre of CO2. Anyway, to get the real world returns that Honda promises, you'll obviously need to do your bit as a driver, which means regularly engaging the most frugal of the four drive settings, Econ, or in the individual mode, running the powertrain in its Econ setting. You'll also need to maximize regenerative braking via the steering wheel paddles and keep an eye on the instrument binnacle's left-hand power meter. The car does its bit to help out too, contributing with a predictive eco assist system, which optimizes the battery state of charge based on the road information and traffic conditions of the selected route. And the center monitor has a selectable power flow option, which has MPG and drive range meters flanking an energy monitor that shows you at any given time what's being powered by what. The design of this car has certainly helped in the significant efficiency improvement it enjoys over its feebler HRV stablemate. A lot of work's gone into reducing weight, for instance, the aluminium bonnets, 43% lighter than the previous Civic's steel panel, and the resin tailgate is 20% lighter than before. Honda's also put in a lot of work to the 2-litre engine. Here, direct injection technology enables fuel to be injected into the power plant multiple times during the combustion phase, which reduces emissions over a wide operating range. This, in turn, helps this Civic cope with a higher compression ratio, resulting in an industry-leading thermal efficiency of 41%. What else? Well, first year road tax is £160 for elegance spec and £180 for sport and advanced trim. As for benefit in kind tax, those low CO2 readings mean that a 40% taxpayer would have a monthly outlay of between £255 and £295, depending on the trim level chosen. Across the range, residual value should be strong. Independent experts reckon that after three years, and 20,000 miles, an advanced spec model like this one would still be worth £13,558. Insurance for all models is Group 28E, and the three-year, 90,000-mile warranty is better than the package you get from many competitors. In addition, surface corrosion is covered for three years, exhaust corrosion is covered for five, chassis corrosion is covered for ten, and structural corrosion for 12 years. Honda rightfully has a very good reputation for reliability, particularly with models built in Japan like this Civic. The brand makes it possible to budget ahead for scheduled maintenance with a fixed price scheme called Five that covers servicing for a total of five years. It also adds an extra two years of maintenance, an extended warranty for this period and roadside assistance breakdown cover should the unexpected happen. This can also be transferred to a new owner if you sell the car before the service plan has expired. We've had just about everything in half a century of Honda Civic history. Three, four and five door body styles, coupes and estates, diesels and little petrol engines, even cinema style folding rear seats. It's still hard, though, in all that time to remember as much of a shift of emphasis as is evident with this 11th generation design. Don't be fooled by the conservative styling. It clothes some really innovative engineering here, and we've waited long enough for that. It seems difficult to believe that this is the first hybrid Civic hatch available in the UK. 
The sort of thing rivals Toyota have been offering for over a decade. Yet, history suggests that when Honda does eventually catch up to a prevailing market trend, it does so in a way that introduces something new and something better. Which might just be what we have here. The Civic E HEV feels like a slightly larger, more mature car than its direct rivals. It's priced at the kind of level that, with quite a few other brands in the family hatchback sector, would only get you relatively ineffectual, mild hybrid technology. Think Focus or Golf. It promises to be safer too. All of which might be enough to allow this Mark 11 Civic to reach out beyond its traditional customer base. But will that happen? It'll be interesting to see.